So one of the things I have to say is I've been in, I'm in my 25th year as an NP and you think, oh my gosh, that's such a long time. But Liz, I have to tell you, I learn something new every week because yeah. cardiology is so dynamic. But I think like an FNP, I think mm -hmm. about the whole person, right? Mm -hmm. All those social determinants of health. I think about prevention. So medication, it's a really important to me. And I'm going to try to add medications to manage the conditions you see in your yeah. practice hypertension, yeah. AFib, heart failure. It's not just a, I'm yeah. here for cardiology and I don't care. Yeah. I actually do. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing I want folks to get out of this episode is that they're partners. Find a cardiology partner, physician, mm -hmm. PA, NP, who you're okay like mm -hmm. chatting with. Well, hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP and you are watching the Real World NP YouTube channel. We make weekly episodes to help save you time, frustration, and help you take the best care of your patients. So I have a really, really delightful interview to share with you. I know that I say this all the time that I love these interviews, but I really, really do. This person is a real gem. Her name is Midge Bowers. She's a cardiology NP who is an educator and has over 20 years of experience. I first met her at the ANP conference where she just gave this talk that was phenomenal. She's just an excellent, excellent educator. And yeah, I just feel like a kindred spirit. So anyway, I want to share with you her bio and then I'll share my interview with her. First, the topics that we talked about. So first one, the topics that we talked about. So we talked about heart failure. We talked about atrial fibrillation and we talked about echoes, but the main focus was really about medication titration and like real practical applied pieces, right? And so I've done two different interviews, cardiology topics. So one was about heart failure, kind of like all about what is guideline directed medical therapy? What does that mean? So definitely check that out if you're feeling like you want a guidance about heart failure. We addressed it. I also had a cardiology interview with another nurse practitioner, but the focus of this one was really like kind of taking some of those things that we talked about and really like, what does that actually look like in clinical practice? So I think that's one of the reasons that I super love this episode. In addition to Midge is just fantastic. So yeah, so so that's the episode, but let me read you her bio so you can know a little bit more about her. So Midge Bowers is a, is a DNP family nurse practitioner, and as well as a cardiology practitioner. She talks a little bit about herself in her intro, what she currently does, but her pronouns are she, her, hers. She's a clinical professor and director of the cardiovascular specialty at Duke University School of Nursing and practices as a nurse practitioner in a heart failure access clinic. Her scholarly work is focused on patients with cardiovascular diseases, interprofessional education, and simulation. I wish I had her as a professor, honestly. She's amazing. As an associate in the American College of Cardiology and a certified health simulation educator. She is the only nurse practitioner on the leadership team of the ACC Simulation Council. She's actively involved in the American Association of Nurse Practitioners and recognized as a fellow in AANP and the American Academy of Nursing. She is both extremely impressive on paper and in person. She's just fantastic. So I really can't wait to share this interview with you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Um, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name's Dr. Midge Bowers. I'm a family nurse practitioner, a professor at Duke School of Nursing, and I work one day a week in a cardiology outpatient practice that focuses on caring for patients with heart failure. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And you and I talked off recording about how many different cardiology topics there are. It's just like one of the, so, so I met you through a conference, through ANP conference. And um, yeah, I think I'm just really struck. I think one of the things that I love about being a family nurse practitioner and being in primary care is that we are like jack of all trades, but then that comes at the kind of cost of master of none, you know? And so I think that I just really appreciated, especially from your talk about cardiology topics is that there's just such a depth to it. And there are so many things that one could talk about, right? And you and I talked off camera about how there's, I had a heart failure episode and I talked with a different cardiology MP, but like, honestly, the topics are endless and it is such a big part of primary care. And so what we sort of talked about is the focuses on kind of the first thing was about uh, medication titration, because that's such a a huge thing for new nurse practitioners, but also myself experienced nurse practitioners, people who are experienced in other practices coming to primary care. So tell me, where do you want to jump in with that topic? Where do you, where do you want to go? So one of the things I have to say is I've been in, I'm in my 25th year as an NP and you think, oh my gosh, that's such a long time. But Liz, I have to tell you, I learned something new every week because yeah. cardiology is so dynamic but I think like an FNP, I think mm -hmm. about the whole person, right? Mm -hmm. All those social determinants of health. I think about prevention. So medication, 
it's a really important to me. And I'm going to try to add medications to manage the conditions you see in your practice, yeah. hypertension, yeah. AFib, heart failure. It's not just a, I'm yeah. here for cardiology and I don't care. Yeah, I actually do. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing I want folks to get out of this episode is that they're partners. Find a cardiology partner, physician, mm-hmm. PA, NP, who you're okay, like mm-hmm. chatting with. Mm-hmm. Recently, I had like messages from a PA in a nursing home who was concerned about diuresing. So yeah. we had, a, neither of us had time to pick up the phone, but we messaged through our electronic health record. Mm. So I just encourage folks, like this was an, offline, the patient wasn't followed at Duke. I said, if I was seeing a patient like this, right? Yeah. This is how I would manage the situation. Yep. Totally. Totally. But, but that keeps me from my liability. I didn't say do this, do this, do this. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yep. But, but ask for that consult peer to peer it. And then, because sometimes you can't get in to the specialists. Yes. That's oh, yeah. the other reality, yes. right? Yes, 100%. delay, 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 delay. Yeah. So that's just kind of one contextual thing I wanted to put out there. Yeah, I um, love that because, like, I. So I, I've talked a little bit. If people have been listening to the podcast for a while, they may have heard this, but um, w- that was one of the pieces of advice that I got from one of my mentors when I first started was cold calling, and I was like, "Are you serious? <laughs> There's no way that's going to happen." And I literally sat down with somebody, and they were like do it right now. Just call them. And like you said, like they might not have time to have a conversation, but you can leave a detailed message, you know, being careful about PHI, but like, what is the detailed question that you have? And like, is there some sort of way to connect with them? Because they really do want to help, right? Because like you can talk about the most recent trials of all these medications and cardiology. Like I can't read that stuff. I don't have time for that stuff. Right. And if it's like a, you know, breaking thing, sure. But like not to the depth that you will. Right. So it's just wonderful it's, to hear that reinforced from specialists. Oh my gosh. Well, I think about the patient that's going for a liver transplant that all of a sudden is coming to my clinic for cardiology clearance and they're mm. on these meds. And I'm like, I have no idea yeah. what this involves totally. and what I should stop and what I shouldn't stop and what is, what's their pre-op risk. I have yeah. to look that up, right? Yeah. So 25 years into it, you still have to look it up. Yeah. Isn't like, that so fun? I love that. I mean, I hate fun. it and I love it at the same time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But you are, what I want to value is the breadth of an FNP's role, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just recently I was doing simulations for adult patients on, you know, PEA arrest and these were acute care NPs. And then the next day I was doing cardiogenic shock in a four month old. So in my head, I was like, well, dang, I know how to calculate the blood pressure for a four yeah. month old, you know, yeah. just all these things that you build on what you know as a nurse to become an Mm -hmm. NP. And Mm -hmm. that just further invigorates me. Yeah. But back to the question about med titration. I think, I think the biggest thing people have is fear. Yeah. Fear of I'm going to do something horrible or I'm not like, I'm going to harm them, but they're going to go home. Yeah. They're going to be readmitted or yeah. Right. All of this. So I have kind of, don't be afraid is the first thing because believe it or not, especially in the context of things like heart failure, you are not going to harm them. Like, oh, they don't have a blood pressure cuff at home or I can't teach them how to take their pulse. But the bottom line is, if you know the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the meds, Mm. you're golden. So let's just start with beta blockers, right? Yeah. So- I was going to say a lot of these, a lot of people listening could be students and new grads and like experience, like it's a a range. So feel free to like start at like square, square one, if you want to, right? Like wherever you want to start. Yeah. So, so I I will just say my focus from a medication titration standpoint for a patient that has heart failure with reduced EF, right? Mm -hmm. Less than or equal to 40% that we used to call systolic heart failure Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. really about getting them on their four pillars of therapy. Okay. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about preserved uh, ejection fraction, but the point is patients live longer and stay out of the hospital. If we can get them even on low doses of those evidence-based medicines. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think in classes, right? So we've got beta blockers, we've got the ACE inhibitors, uh, ACE, ARB, ARNI, angiotensin, Mm -hmm. nephrolysin inhibitors, and then we've got mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, basically mm-hmm. our potassium sparing diuretics, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And then SGLT2 inhibitors. Mm. So you look at all of this, how am I going to get somebody on four medicines? And oh my gosh, how are they going to afford it? And that's mm-hmm. a lot. But wait a second. It used to be we'd start one at a time and go up. Yep. Yep. The data shows us that even starting two 
or even all four because yeah. average heart failure hospital stay is four to seven days. Yeah. Well, in that seven days, you can get those meds, mm. but think about what you're doing, right? So example, someone comes in, they have a history of hypertension and I'm deciding to start them on an evidence-based beta blocker, right? Am I going to pick carvedilol that mm. has alpha and beta properties, which will lower blood pressure? Or am I going to pick metoprolol, yeah. succinate? I'm going to pick carvedilol. Yeah. It's twice yep. a day, yeah. but it's now it's generic, right? But I can get more bang for my buck. And mm -hmm. fast forward, that's how you explain it to the patient. Mm. Oh, Ms. Rohr, I'm going to start you on a medicine that's going to treat your heart failure and your high blood pressure. Mm. Really? Nice. I may take away a medicine like a calcium channel blockers, like yeah. in lodipine, right? Yeah. So then you've got a, you've got negotiation, <laughs> shared decision-making. <laughs> yes. Mitch just took away a medicine, right? Totally, totally. Right. And and twice a day, most people can do. It's the TID ones and the QID. I'm like, oh, for Those gosh sakes, brutal. why do we... Yeah. Yeah. So that's just like one decision point, right? Um, just remember it's metoprolol succinate, like yeah. the long acting one we should be yes. using. And that gets into, so I start them on an ACE inhibitor and the blood pressure drops and yeah. oh my gosh, but I had them on a beta blocker too. What do I do? Mm. What do you do in that situation? Oh man. Um, I'll, I'll give you an I, easy thing. Do you ever split their meds? There's so many options so, to go. Go ahead, right. go ahead. But, but here's an easy peasy one. Yes. This yeah, is yeah. where I go. Take one in the morning and one at night. They're both mm -hmm. once a day. Yep. With Carvedilol? So if it was Carvedilol, you would just- No, do not Carvedilol. Oh, 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 so, sorry. So, so that's, or with Carvedilol, if they're on, say, uh, Secubitril Valsartan, I'm not going to talk brand names here. Yeah. But if they're on like an Ace, Arnie, or Arb that's twice a day, Okay. I say, take it in the uh, at breakfast and at dinner. And then take your carvedilol at lunch and at bedtime. Mm, that's interesting. Right? Cool. Yeah. We've gotten all the doses in. Now that's if they're going to remember that. We've got to yeah. think about what kind of work they do. Are they totally. going to remember to take it? Totally. So totally. if they're not going to remember a twice a day med, I, mean, yeah. I just put them on once a day. Even for the, you know, supposedly Secubitril Valsartan has a better efficacy than maybe uh, Ramipril, right? Yeah. Or ACE or... Uh, low sartan. But if I know they're not going to take it twice a day, I'm still, I'm just going to keep them on mm, the once a day. Totally. Right? And can you say, can you say a little bit more about the Secubitrol of Valsartan? Sure. So that's, man? yeah. So, uh, um, you know, a brand name, I'll just say brand name is Entresto and it really has been shown to reduce uh, hospitalizations, but more important, the reduction in symptoms and mortality has been profound. Mm. so and this is the so, arnie correct this is an arnie yeah. right so it's inhibiting that neprilysin that really is detrimental in heart failure yeah unfortunately it's still so cost prohibitive in, yeah. in some formularies yeah but the patient assistance programs i'm fortunate we have apps in the hospital pas and mps starting those forms yes <laughs> so while they're in the, the hospital they get outpatient we're like totally. oh, we could follow up which is totally. wonderful yeah right um and and that's a big part, but, but from an initiation standpoint, I think about, you know, even if they started two in the hospital, so maybe they started an Arnie mm -hmm. and uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, like yeah. empagliflozin or dupagliflozin, another one shown to reduce hospitalizations. You can then, when they come outpatient, check labs, right? And start the potassium sparing diuretic, the spironolactone mm -hmm. or a plerinone, as well mm -hmm. as a, a beta blocker. Mm -hmm. Now I want to back up a minute. And yeah, um, yeah. so we've talked about ARNIs and, and really the benefits. So that's your kind of gold standard. But again, ACEs and ARBs, if you can get them on there and their potassium stays stable, then you can go ahead and add that potassium sparing diuretic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But SGLT2 inhibitors, the cool thing about them is they diurese. And when you can tell mm. folks that you're going to be urinating out sugar or you're going to pee out sugar, we might be able to back off on your fluid pill. Mm. That's another yep. benefit, yep. renal protection, right? Yeah. Preserving the kidneys, ASARBs, ARNIs, all protect the kidneys, even without diabetes. But gosh, if I can get you off a diuretic yeah. or oh lower dose, yes. woohoo, less, yeah. you know, another win, less right? Meds. Yeah. Right. Less meds, but less disruption in, in lifestyle. Yep. Um, yeah. So all of that, I think. So 
often when I start like uh, empagliflozin, for example, mm -hmm. um, I will cut their diuretic dose in half. Now, sometimes people are like, hey, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like, remember, diuretics are just palliative. Mm -hmm. They're just treating your symptoms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's no mortality benefit. You'd rather be on this empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, even now sotagliflozin to help you improve your mortality. Yes. Yep. Right. Totally. Do you know that now um, it's still one in five, the mortality is 50% at five years with you have a diagnosis of heart failure. Wow. It has wow. been that day since I way since I started in 1999, oh we have gosh, not moved yeah. the needle enough. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. So I, I guess, I guess in terms of the titration, I guess I'm thinking about students I'm thinking about new grads right. and I'm thinking about some scenarios. So I, I, um, yeah. Like what are, I guess, do you have any idea of like common scenarios that you see that like people are calling about? Like, is it, so my background is in federally qualified health centers. And so sure. we wouldn't have the most kind of like novel medications because of cost um, being cost prohibitive. And so, and we also have the situation of patients who weren't able to go to cardiology for a long time or like right. just missed their appointments because they ran out of insurance, like things like that. Yeah. And so, oh yeah. Or don't have transportation. Yeah. And so I think clinics. Totally. Okay. And I feel, so I feel like the, there's so many pieces, so many things we could touch on with that scenario, but I guess when it comes to the medications, so just to, to like, kind of like ground reorient, like what our goal for heart failure patients is that they're on those guideline directed medical treatments, GDMT, which is those classes that you talked about, um, which mm -hmm. we, I touched on in the, in the other heart failure episode, but like the goal is to get them on those medicines at the goal doses, correct? Based correct. on like the research studies. Except that uh, recently I read, uh, and I'm going to read this because I wrote better to have the patient on low doses of all four uh -huh. rather than fewer meds uh, at the target okay. dose. That's so interesting. So, so yeah. the, the script has flipped a little, it yes. used to be sequential adding, yes, yes, yes. get them to don't add the next till you're really titrated up. Now it's like, get them on all four, mm. believe it or not, titrate every one to two weeks. Wow. Based on really heart fast. Wow. Right. Based on, and yeah, what are you, what are you looking at when you're titrating? Is this outpatient or is this in, this sounds like outpatient. it's outpatient. Okay. Absolutely outpatient. And okay. we have, um, like I might see you in clinic and bump your, let's just do beta blocker, right? Yeah. Bump your beta blocker up. Yeah. And I might have an, a pharmacist or a nurse call you in a week and have you go up again. Mm, based um, on your blood pressure and how they're feeling, if any orthostasis or dizziness, things like right. that. So symptoms okay. are often the driver because I can't tell you how many times we get, we are the ones as providers mm. that get hum, hung up on having, well, what their blood pressure do, what their heart rate do. Yep. Yep. If they're in your clinic today mm -hmm. with a resting heart rate in the eighties and yeah. your goal is to have a resting heart rate in the seventies, mm -hmm. right? Because when they're active, it's going to go up you can feel free to start them on 25 of metoprolol succinate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then titrate it at that visit to 50 and then a phone call later to a hundred mm -hmm. mm -hmm. as long as they're asymptomatic. So it's yeah. more important to catch that orthostatic hypotension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. in the South, we call it swimmy headed. So do you get all swimmy <laughs> headed that. when you stand <laughs> up from the chair? Isn't that cute? Oh, uh, it's so really adorable. descriptive. Yeah. You, know, you could say lightheaded, dizzy, but really yeah, swimmy headed. You stand up, you get what? your head feels. I'm not going to titrate or I'm going to yes. split your dose right mm -hmm. morning and night, you know, mm -hmm. alternate it with the other therapies mm -hmm. or deprescribe that calcium yeah. channel blocker or something mm -hmm. else that might make you yeah. dizzy. Yeah. But really, as opposed to over several months, the clinical benefit is to have you on all four medicines, even mm -hmm. within that first month. Uh -huh. with titration to maximally tolerated doses. Wow. Sometimes it's symptom driven. Yeah. Sometimes it's blood pressure driven. And a lot of folks yeah. do have a home blood pressure cuff. Yeah. 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 The key for me, the safety issue, and this is my pearl is make sure you check uh, kidney function and potassium mm. a week after you start like spironolactone or clarinone, totally. because that in combination, I mean, it sounds mm -hmm. like best practice, but I won't see them back in my clinic. They're yeah. two hours away in their home yeah. clinic. So yeah. what do I do? I fax an order or submit an order to their primary care provider. Totally. Totally. And honestly, like we need, I feel like I just, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to being a new grad and like, I feel like we need all the reminders we can get. <laughs> yeah. 
if that's in there, right. Of like, yeah, we do want to check those labs. Yeah. And I just, I do want to, I do want to pause and say like, if you're a new grad listening and you're like, wow, I'm overwhelmed. Like that is also yes. normal and fine because, um, I would actually recommend you tag teaming with somebody. If you have a patient with heart failure, needing multiple medication titrations, like that's probably not for a super novice. Like you can do oh. it, but like, let's run that by somebody too, just to like double check ourselves there. So. And yeah. I'll be really transparent. The guidelines, like all these updates and I yeah. look for green, yellow, and red. Yeah. So I actually have at my work site, the mm-hmm. printed one pager yeah. that says heart failure with reduced EF. What's all green? Should I be thinking about? Yeah. Not that I'm yeah. going to do it all today. Yeah. What's all, what's yellow? What's orange? Yeah. Because for half pef, we never had yeah. anything except diuretics. And yeah. now it's like, oh, think about SGLT2s. Well, if mm. I didn't have that right on the little board next to me, totally, I would You'll be like, <laughs> right, zoom, Rip. just treat the comorbidities, Midge, yeah. move on, right? Totally. Sleep apnea, you know, AFib. So we all need cues and reminder. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I'm not, not embarrassed to say I will go to up to date in front of the patient. I heard yeah. you in an episode talking about oh, like, yeah, yeah. leaving the room, go here yes. or go to my clinical guidelines app and just totally. look at my phone. We're just checking a minute to make sure totally. that I'm not missing anything. And patients appreciate that. They do. They do. I feel like I had so much imposter syndrome as a new grad. I couldn't handle being in front of the patient doing it. But now, (laughs) yeah, totally. Same thing. I'm just like, yeah, we're just, let's just do some double checking. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm glad you mentioned FH, um, H, federally qualified health centers. Yes. FQHCs, because I do think about that and I keep Mm. up to date, like what's on their formulary. So you're going Mm. to see, you know, so-and-so at at the local community, um, clinic. Okay. I know that these meds are on that formulary, right? And yeah. I can't, but I'm going to write a note, make sure your mm-hmm. provider gets it. They're going to see what the plan is. So I try to be as transparent in my plan, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which uh, I'll give you my student story. I have grads that work inpatient in the hospital. And all of a sudden I had a student dictating their discharge summary. And it would say needs need to get a basic metabolic panel, should titrate this, should do this. And they'd say, Dr. Bowers, I felt terrible telling you what to do, knowing you were going to see them in mm-hmm. clinic. I was like, oh no, no I would do. much rather yes. in a busy clinic, yeah. have you A, remind me or mm-hmm. B, guide my treatment so yes. that we're all part of the same team. Totally. totally. So I'm going to say, Liz, you know, to get follow-up labs at PCP visit with nurse practitioner role. Yeah. Like it's that's such a what relief. I'm do. Yeah. I love it. I love it when they have a plan. I'm like, thank you for telling me what to do. <laughs> because we're so busy and so yes. overloaded that yes. that just kind of guides it. And, yeah. and it also shows the partnership. Totally. Totally. And if you think about it, like at least I do that for myself when I make my own plan of care, I'm spelling it out for myself, but also it's spelling it out for the next provider. If I'm not there that day, or, or if that person comes in in between our next follow-up, like they're going to know what the deal is. Like they can, Oh, I can, I'm tracking based on your HPI and your plan. Like what the plan. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's good. So I I know we've covered a lot on guideline directed medical therapy, but I think the urgency to get a little bit of those four pillars yeah. is so important to reduce yeah. mortality, yep. not just reduce hospitalization. And if you yep. can help patients say these medicines, you may feel yucky when you first start. And mm-hmm. I always tell them that mm-hmm. because you're used to high blood pressure or you're used yeah. to yep. being so short of breath, but ultimately these are going to help keep you out of the hospital, feel better and live mm-hmm. longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then you yeah. got the buy-in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and we did want to talk about, um, both echoes and anticoagulation. Yes. If we have time, I'd love to touch yes. on half, pe- or, uh, ha- well, I always get half pef preserved as yeah, a half fraction. Yeah. Um, One thing I, I want to oh, just mention is diuretics. Um, I was just going to say that's, can we touch on that first is diuretics. Yes, so go ahead, go ahead. This is so important. What I get calls yeah. from, how do you know this call from the nursing home? It was, uh, how much diuretic, what should I do? Uh, Here's an easy formula or yeah. principle, Pearl, yeah. um, double the diuretic for two to three days. Mm-hmm. If they're not responding to that, add metolazone or zeroxalin, mm-hmm. two and a half milligrams, 30 minutes before their morning dose. So if mm-hmm. they're on multi-dose, mm-hmm. if that doesn't work, switch your loop diuretic because mm-hmm. loops, you know, HCTZ, I don't count as a diuretic Mm-mm. in heart failure. Mm-mm. It's really ineffective. Um, any of those combo meds, just, yeah. you know, get them back on a pure medicine and add yep. a loop. 
Exactly. If they're on furosemide, switch them to torsemide because there's mm-hmm. something called diuretic tolerance. I didn't mm-hmm. know about that for oh, several I didn't know that. years. Yeah. There's cool. a dose response curve to diuretics, yes. but it's also, if you switch diuretics, you may get, uh, even though it's the same class, you yeah. may get a benefit. Can you talk a bit about the dose response curve for, for the new people? Sure. So from, you know, we think that each time you like double a dose, so you're going from 20 of Lasix to 40 of Lasix, you should get a better response, mm-hmm. but there's a ceiling effect. So you mm-hmm. get it up to a certain amount and I would have to look at the chart to be honest totally. to see yeah, what yeah. that amount is, totally. but you're like, well, I'll just keep titrating and keep titrating. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the salient point about this is people go, I'm not peeing as much. Well, is that because their renal function is declining? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Let's, just... let's put that in there as a little yeah. pearl. Dart. Keep in your mind. <laughs> Don't just focus on the diuretics. Think about the kidneys. Yes. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. And, and also, um, you know, we tend not to fluid restrict people, but if they're not drinking a lot, is there anything yeah. to pee out? Like yeah. you've got to yeah. think that. So, so for folks with heart failure, you can titrate up. I mean, I've had patients on 160 of Lasix twice a day. That's 320 in a day. That's a yeah, lot. A, that's a lot. <laughs> right. But, but that's because I do this as a specialty. Yeah. What yep. I'm saying is you're also, if it's not effective anymore, it could be that they're not absorbing. Yeah. So that's when you really need to consult cardiology. They just mm-hmm. may need a dose of IV Lasix to mm-hmm. get them over the hump. Oh, interesting. So I have a question. Um, so I, I, I love to bring it. And one of the things I love about your teaching is how practical you are. So I'm just yeah. thinking practically for a moment. So if I have a patient in front of me, just ap- applied, I mean, yeah. like, so if I have a patient in front of me and they, their weight is up, um, they are like, they're like, you can tell that they have edema, like in their lower extremities, but like, they're not short of breath. They're not having any like chest pain, things like that. And it's like, oh, well I did just have like a holiday and I had a lot of food, like a lot of salty foods, things like that. You know, like, you know, the holiday yeah. season is tricky for that. So if I, so I, that's the kind of situation, if they're like their blood pressure is stable, their heart rate is stable, all that stuff is stable. That's when I would probably want to double that dose for two to three days and then have them like, what is that follow-up process look like, especially for new grads who are paranoid about like lab function, right? Like how how recent should their labs have been? How do I know if their kidneys can handle that for three days? Should I check their labs immediately? Am I going to put them in renal failure? Like I'm just yes, yes. Yeah, zooming the, back the to angst, my... I hear it, right? Yes. <laughs> so you just described somebody who is warm and wet. There's this beautiful yes. cascade oh, that talks yes. about that warm chart and you wet showed and beautiful. cold and wet, right? But warm and wet, they're perfused. Yes. Even if they're short, they may be short of breath. That's okay. But they're hemodynamically stable, right? Yeah. It's not a specific blood pressure number. My blood pressure runs in the 90s. If mine's in the 80s, that's a problem. But if I'm 90 to 100, you can still diurese me orally. Mm. So, so oh my God, that's so scary not, for so many new people. <laughs> I know, I know. But remember, if they're walking around, walking, talking, well mm-hmm. perfused, you feel a distal pulse, right? They're not yeah. cold and clammy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. People are walking around without their electrolytes checked every single day. Mm-hmm. All we do mm-hmm. in primary care and outpatient care is do a snapshot, is a Polaroid yeah. picture or an iPhone picture of your labs. That's today. You could eat a whole bunch of, you know, I don't know, high potassium foods and your potassium go up, but your kidneys should adjust. Yeah. So you should feel okay looking at, I did labs today, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. This is where I know I'm starting. Yeah. Or I saw them within the past month. I wouldn't go like six months worth of labs. I might go two months. So I saw you two mm-hmm. months ago. You're now messaging, calling, you're fluid overloaded. I don't need you to come in for a visit today. I'm going to double your 40 LA6. You're going to take it twice a day for the next two days and call me back. If you're not feeling better, I'm mm-hmm. going to have you come in the office. Yeah. And I'm going to draw labs. If mm-hmm. you are feeling better, I'm going to have you come for a lab only visit. Nice. I, I evaluated you over the phone. I did an intervention. I'm following up. Yeah. You don't need potassium levels every day. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can look at trends if this yeah. is somebody who's followed, right? Oh, this person runs about three, three, five, three, six. Maybe I'll have them uh, supplement with dietary, mm-hmm. or maybe I need to give them a potassium supplement mm-hmm. if they're, mm-hmm. you know, for a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's a helpful. calming way to yeah. say, Ooh, yeah, okay. totally safe very safe. You're not going to drop someone's blood pressure. They're not going to pass out Mm -hmm. really two to three days. And Mm -hmm. how do they respond? 
Because mm-hmm. oh, you're right, that. holiday eating, funeral eating. Yeah, I do all sorts of counseling related to that. That trip absolutely. people absolutely, absolutely. And, and I just I do want to stress again that like for newer people, like or if you're just, it doesn't matter how much experience you have. If you're uncomfortable, just asking for help. Because I'm, oh. I mean, I'm asking you these questions, being like, okay, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to bring this back. Like, right? Like I'm, I'm writing all this stuff down, and I, and I, yeah, it's there's no shame but in asking for help, and there's no absolutely. expectation to know it. So. Yeah. And, and, and I'll just tell you, like antibiotics are my nemesis. Every yeah. time I have a patient <laughs> that I know they have a complicated UTI or I mm-hmm. know that they have pneumonia, I don't mm-hmm. send them for a chest x-ray. I actually listen for egophony, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I have to treat And I'm like, oh, darn, they're on all these other meds. So I have to go yep. look up antibiotics for this treatment based on their re- creatinine, EGFR. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know that. Mm -hmm. So you can do anything for a long time, but you have to be safe. Totally. Right. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts to add about, um, people with, I think people also get really uncomfortable with, um, decreased renal function, um, Mm -hmm. with diuresis. Like if you have the, that kind of combination of heart failure, fluid overload and reduced kidney function, do you have any like kind of pearls there for people? Cause I know nephrologists do a ton of, like, there's always like that argument between the, you know, uh, nephrologists and cardiologists of like what we should do or whatever, but yeah. Do you have any pearls about that? So especially for this is absolutely. Cause this is something I really, I always paid attention to BUN and creatinine, BUN and creatinine. Yeah. And yet with the newer meds, especially yeah. like the SGLT2s, the glomerular filtration rate. Yeah. EGFR. So I am so biased because most of my patients don't have a normal creatinine. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Creatinine is that snapshot. Again, it fluctuates up and down. Your Mm -hmm. GFR is what you're really impacting. Mm. And remember that people who are in heart failure with congestion Mm -hmm. often have an elevated creatinine. Mm -hmm. And then you take the fluid off and guess what happens to the creatinine? Mm. It goes down. Cool. That's, that's helpful so, so know. like, Oh, Oh my gosh, I'm seeing a creatinine of 1.9. I'm freaking out. I don't want to diarrhea them. I'm going to damage their kidneys. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. Because they're symptomatic. So you look at their GFR, their GFR may be dipped down a little, but it's not going to go below 30. Yeah. Right. With a creatinine yeah. of 1.9. Yeah. I'm going to diarrhea them. And guess what? The creatinine comes back 1.2 and you're yeah. like, Oh, yes, I fixed it. And they feel better. <laughs> but that, yes. that freaked me out. I couldn't yes. understand. I was like, mm-hmm. wait, wait. So the rule about creatinine is really a, a, a 0.3 change. Like you really don't want to, your therapy shouldn't change the creatinine more than 0.3. That's mm-hmm. when you start getting concerned. Cool. Cool. Okay. Oh, I, love so, those, I love those concrete pearls. They're so helpful. <laughs> That is like one of my, ooh, ooh, what did I do? And look at trends. Like just mm-hmm. in your other episode, you mentioned like BNP. We don't mm-hmm. treat BNP. Mm-hmm. We treat trends. We look at uh, uh, creatinine trends. Like what's baseline for that person? Mm-hmm. And Definitely. and remember, they're going to look at their labs and go, it says I'm in moderate kidney failure. <laughs> well, yes, because you've had heart failure for a while, mm-hmm. you know, and and we're continuously monitoring it and we're supporting it. Do I need dialysis? You don't need dialysis, but mm-hmm. they read, you know, those mm-hmm. interpretations yeah. and you're now getting panic calls. So totally just, re- you know, relax. But I think that's probably one of those other things that took me a while. What's your filtration rate? Let's look at how your kidneys are really filtering the toxins in your body. And then it helps us both understand. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So here's the thing about echoes. I think yeah. your uh, previous cardiology NP speaker did a great job of talking about like which diagnostic test to order. Yeah. But just in case folks haven't seen that episode, totally. I think a couple things to remember. First is why am I getting this test? Right. Mm-hmm. I always go, mm-hmm. you have to know why you're getting it. Yeah. So for simple things, like I look at the structure of the heart, the valves and the ejection fraction, the function of the left ventricle, right? That's simple. Do I want to, do I have a patient with known valve disease that I want to look at progression over time, right? As far as ejection fraction goes, you also want to have patients on adequate therapy for at least three months. So mm-hmm. patients sometimes get a little eager. You started me on the medicine. Is my ejection fraction better? Is it better? Is it better? And you're like, whoa, it takes Hold a couple horses. months. <laughs> yeah. Three months is the magic mm-hmm. number. Don't, don't do anything you know, until they've been on good therapies for three months. Yeah. The other thing is, um, is looking at uh, the left ventricle and you see words like akinetic, 
hypocontractile, mm-hmm. and I was a dyskinetic. I'm like, what do all these things mean, right? Totally. Well, akinetic is pretty easy. A absence of kinetic mm-hmm. movement, so no movement. So if I see an echo report that says the inferior wall is akinetic, do you know what I know? Mm-hmm. That person probably had an inferior MI because mm-hmm. it's dead. Mm-hmm. It's not moving. Mm-hmm. We're not going to fix that. Yeah, it's gone. Versus hypokinetic or hypocontractile, depending on how your echo. That means there's options to improve that area, especially if it's mm. in a region. So maybe this is a person who has known coronary disease and might need angioplasty, might need bypass surgery. It's not for you to decide, yep. but looking at an echo report, I always say, what's the quality of it? You know, they say poor, moderate, nobody ever says excellent. And then you go <laughs> down and you look at left ventricle wall motion. There's about yeah. six different does it say global hypocontractility? Mm-hmm. More than likely it's um, an etiology that's not ischemic, like mm-hmm. not reversible. Mm-hmm. So from a virus, from chemotherapy, from mm-hmm. peripartum, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So global hypocontractility or hypokinesis, you hope to improve the function, but, yeah. but that's less likely an ischemic origin. Then you look at the ejection fraction. Is it less than or equal to 40? Is it that 41 to 49? Or is it 50 and over? And that kind of gives you your three buckets of treatment. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I look at, what is their interpretation? Is this their second echo, their 14th echo? You know, is it worse, better, or the same? Yeah. Now there's a special group that I think, you know, you see tons of patients in AFib, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it could be paroxysmal, chronic, bless you. Mm -hmm. It's more pervasive than ever. One of the things that I learned from an electrophysiologist is if you're getting an echo and you think, oh, well, my patient's an AFib, they're going to go for a cardioversion. If their left atrium is dilated, mm. and I'm not going to give you numbers because it doesn't matter. Just yeah. look, if it says severely enlarged, yeah, male or woman, you are not going to cardiovert. And here's how I describe mm. it. That atrium is so dilated, the electrical system's distorted. There's no way your cup, a shock is going to make it better. Mm. So that's when you might need, they might need an ablation. They might need meds titrated, but that's another kind of pearl of, hmm, oh, this patient's stable in their AFib, but I'm going to look what their atrial size is in case mm. they're thinking about cardioversion, mm. right? Cool. So th- that, that was one of those, huh? It's just not effective. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Cool. So that's really like the, the main things of an echo is don't yeah. get mired in the, the details. Yeah. Again, you're comparing a prior echo. You're looking for improvement on therapy because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. maybe they'll need a defibrillator or a, a pacemaker. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I know you wanted to talk about was anticoagulation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so there's so many questions. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, the context for this question was yeah. um, uh, people. I think that I guess the to I, I also like to give examples because it really normalizes yes, the imposter absolutely. syndrome. <laughs> For yes. grads of like, you're not alone. We all feel this way or felt this way. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of discomfort around. So I've had a lot of students, for example, that um, they will uh, hear an irregular heartbeat. They will do um, an EKG and they'll be like, hands shaking, like, is this, what is this? And I'm like, well, what do you think it is? And like, I think it's AFib. And I'm like, well, it is AFib. And they're like, okay, so I just like refer it. Like, what should I do? And it's like, oh no, no. Like, what else should I do? I'm like, no, no, like, that's like your diagnosis. Like you made a diagnosis, like congratulations. <laughs> you AFib, you made the diagnosis. Great. So what are you going to do about that? And so, um, and I think that that's, there's like a panic moment there of yeah. like a new diagnosis. And then there's also the people who are on things already And I know, like, I guess the fact, the variables to think about are, um, and I've touched on this a little bit, but I feel like refreshers and different perspectives are always so helpful, but like, what are your kind of steps when it comes to either a new diagnosis or somebody who is, um, already on medications and like, we're thinking about the treatment options of like, we can kind of just keep it to the two main categories, unless you want to add more things, but the DOAX and then, uh, warfarin basically are the two kind of main categories, at least that I see. Um, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts about okay. that? In the context so I have that? some easy confidence building tools for Beautiful. folks, right? Awesome. Because this was my panic area. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally. Um, no. And, I, and I'm giving an example because I also did like, that as a new grad. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so DOACs weren't invented when I started mm-hmm. as an NP. So mm-hmm. that is one thing. My first week of 
everybody left, I was on call and I was needing to manage warfarin in about a million pe people. Mm -hmm. And I panicked. And luckily I had a pharmacist who was a pharmacy fellow. So I had a, a local resource mm -hmm. and I ran everything by the attending the, to the point that he finally said, Mitch, would you stop calling me? You're giving me all the right <laughs> answers. And I went, okay. So I now use this as a teaching tool in my class. We do an on-call sim. Mm -hmm. Say, so I'm going to start with warfarin first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and warfarin, it's not just about this one dose. Again, if you look at lab results are always a snapshot in time. What you need to look at is the patient's total weekly dose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you're making adjustments and people say, but I have a nomogram or I have a chart or the pharmacist does this. And I'm like, you could be in the grocery store, picking up children from ballet, getting the dog from the groomer. You have to know how to do this. Yes. So let's just pick AFib as an example. Your INR range is two to three. And say the person only wants to be on warfarin, they trust warfarin, they don't want to be on these other meds. So you get an INR, that's 1.5, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to look at what's the reason, right? If mm -hmm. they've been taking their med, haven't missed any doses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you go through the Ds, as they're going to change in diet, are there any new drugs and have they been drinking alcohol? Mm. Those are kind of my quick little nice diet, drugs, drinking and, and drugs also refer to substances, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, and no missed doses. So now I say, wow, you are on five milligrams every day. Five times seven is 35. That's mm -hmm. 35 milligrams total weekly dose. What did I say? They were on 1.6 and I need to get them to two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to increase that total weekly dose by 10 to 15%. Mm hmm you can go up to 20 if it was really low, mm -hmm, but that, mm -hmm. that's a safe way to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Today they're yeah. 1.6, uh, 10% of their total weekly dose is 3.5. Mm. I have to, I have to keep the math simple. Um, <laughs> you know, even if we said, okay, 15, you know, maybe I'm going up four milligrams. Well, I look at what size tablets do they have at home mm -hmm, too? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't want 15, oh my God, such a rookie mistake that I would make. Yeah. <laughs> 15 strengths. Tell me the strength of your tablet. Yeah. Oh, if so I confusing. say, hmm, I want to increase you to get you back to your therapeutic range. I'm going to have you take, uh, break your five milligram tablet and take an extra two and a half tonight, mon Monday, and take another two and a half tomorrow night. Right. But that's five milligrams, mid. You went up like 20%. Then have them check on Friday mm -hmm. or- you know, there's lots of ways, but yeah. the easy is remember it's their total weekly dose, 10 to 15% up, 10 to 15% down, and then check an INR several days later. Like I, mm. I say within, because warfarin has a longer half-life than the DOAX, right? So you mm -hmm. don't want to check mm -hmm. it tomorrow like yep. you do in the hospital. Yeah. Three to four days later. Yeah. Safe. Yeah. Formulaic plan. Diet. Drugs, drinking, missed doses, 10 to 15% up or down. That's so Just great. Just know mechanical valves are 2.5 to 3.5. So you've yes, got to yes, know yes. your ranges. Yes. Right? Yeah. And the reason and for their anticoagulation. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But that's like the simple way. And then as far as the DOAX, my biggest message on these DOAX are... Mm. We are so under treating our older adults. We are so oh my worried gosh. about falls. That's the panic. And, yes. Oh, falls and a head bleed. Guess yes. what? I think it's worse to have a head bleed and, and not be able to, you've just, it's worse to have a stroke, excuse me, than a head bleed. So yes. here's some safe tools. You use the Chad's VAS score, little yep. calculator on everything. Have you ever heard of the has bled? H A S. Yes. Right. Yeah, but so people you, might not have. So go, go right. So go has ahead. bled score looks at your risk for bleeding. Mm -hmm. So if I'm saying, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. Chad's vast gives you formulas for do they have heart failure? How old are they? Are they a man or a woman? Do they have vascular disease? Right? Have they had a stroke? What's your stroke risk? Has bled looks at hypertension, liver function, bleeding history, um, history of labile INRs, my bleeding risk, and then you balance them out. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. how you make a good evidence-based clinical decision. And guess what? I put yeah. it in my notes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, totally. If I say Chad's VASC equals this, has bled equals this, anticoagulate. 
I mm-hmm. just learned, and I'm looking at this, it's called the Spark Tool. S-P-A-R-C. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me about that. I haven't I looked like, at it yet. Yeah, oh, go ahead. All it does is combine the has Chad's Fask and the Hasplit. I'm like, <laughs> but they added so in, helpful. are they on NSAIDs or antiplatelets? Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, important. Yeah. But again, if we use evidence-based tools yeah. that are usually available either, you know, online or in an app. Yeah and document that in our note. Yeah. Then if the 92 year old, you know, tripped and fell and hit their head. Yeah. That's not on you. Yeah. You've given good evidence because their risk of stroke mm-hmm. was, you know, 58%. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And you've had the conversation with the patient and as well. And you've had shared decision-making. Yeah. Right. It's all about that of yeah. what do you want to do? So I just, that's pretty much my passion. There are reversal agents. I haven't had to use any of them for mm-hmm. these several of like a Pixaban and Dabigatran and mm-hmm. a Doxaban. Mm-hmm. Um, there are reversal agents for them now, which is also mm-hmm. a benefit. So if you're concerned, yeah. you and I aren't measuring factor 10, a levels as a routine totally. practice. Totally. I don't, I don't want the folks who may work at an academic health center and then they're brand new NPs going, I'd like a factor 10 A level. And I'd like this and this like, whoa, 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 no, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Cost stewardship. And, totally. and really what does the patient need? And I think yeah. for your listeners, um, Liz, I think that's it yeah. is you're going to over order at your yes. first, you know, as a brand new provider, you're going to over order if you're uncomfortable. Yes. But as you increase your confidence and I always say, get a buddy on board, whether they're physically with you in the clinic or they're just a phone call away. Yep. That's going to increase your confidence. Absolutely. Well, can I ask, can I ask briefly? So I actually feel way more confident with Warfarin than I do with the DOAX, just because like, that's how I came into practice was, um, that's all we had because it was kind right. of, it was just too expensive. Um, right. so I'm very comfortable with that. And I know, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the mentees I've worked with kind of like across the country, it's so different, whatever their yes. comfort level is. Cause they're like, Oh my gosh, I've never even seen Warfarin before. And it's like, Oh no, no, that's literally all I do. So if you had somebody, for example, like Um, And it's so hard because I'm not in the school setting right now of like, what are they kind of covering? And I think it's different depending on the school, but like, yeah, I guess they could be covering this already in school. But if, if I'm thinking also of the people who are switching into practice, who've been out of school for a while, like if, if you're doing like DOAX 101, like Mm -hmm. what, what are your, do you, what are your pearls of practice that you have of like, so for example, if you have warfarin, you have to monitor the INRs. Um, it's kind of annoying for people. And so, yeah, like what is your decision making between warfarin and DOAX? And then like, what are, what, what are some pearls of practice that you have just kind of briefly about the DOAC choices and management of those? So that's a really good question because um, I tend to not have folks on, I'm not usually initiating the anticoagulation yeah. Yeah. unless they come to clinic in AFib and then I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't initiate for AFib. I don't initiate anybody on warfarin because the DOACs are more affordable now. Mm-hmm. So that's one yep. thing. And on yep. more formularies yep. from a warfarin perspective, I manage folks who have valve disease and that's mm-hmm. really, um, you know, mechanical valve specifically yeah. where mm-hmm. I'm, I'm managing warfarin or mm-hmm. someone, I had somebody recently who has factor five Leiden disease and they are, have DVTs and PEs mm-hmm. ad nauseum. Like, mm-hmm. so they're mm-hmm. just on chronic warfarin therapy and they actually yeah. do their own home INRs. That's awesome. That's so, awesome. which is wonderful. And this yeah. particular individual is only 38 years old. I had a patient like that. Yeah. Um, she didn't do self titration, but she was really young with factor. Yeah. Factor. Yeah. So, so you, so, so that situation, what I've found, and part of it is just by choice, a Pixaban mm-hmm. um, it is very safe to use. I've had less like GI bleeds or adverse events as opposed to maybe Dabigatran mm-hmm. again. And then it's what I'm comfortable with. It's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. Right. I know my antihypertensives I'm comfortable with my, uh, SGLT twos. I would, you know, prescribe one of the other based on my comfort mm-hmm. of what I've seen. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The thing about a Pixaban is if uh, renal function, if kidney function declines, you have yeah. to go from that five twice a day down to 2.5 if they mm-hmm. need a couple of categories. Yeah. So I would encourage folks to pick, you know, one that's mm-hmm. available on your formulary yeah. or the formulary of wherever you you know, your region, because we mm-hmm. also know some medicines are regional yeah, yeah. and the bright new shiny object is not always the best choice. Yeah. Get to know that medicine, mm-hmm. see how your patients tolerate it. 
because I'm often at the mercy of what they've started in the hospital. Yes. Right? I see someone 100%. in a hospital follow up and I'm not going to switch the dabigatran to a pixaban just because yeah. of my comfort. Just because okay, you like you're it. on this, right? <laughs> you know, but but that's yeah. it. And all and just do the same instructions for um, you know, I, I think our opportunity, even though I would say I don't unbecome a nurse when I become mm-hmm. a nurse practitioner. Mm-hmm. Still, the name is there. Mm-hmm. So talking about all the bleeding, I ask yeah. every single patient, whether they're on a blood thinner or not, mm-hmm. about do you cough up blood, vomit blood, or see blood in the toilet? Mm-hmm. I have diagnosed mm-hmm. cancer twice by asking just those questions. Oh my gosh. Wow. wow. So, so really bleeding on a medicine, not on a medicine, it's easy. You don't have to say, do you have hemoptysis? Do you have hemoptysis? No. <laughs> Cough totally. up blood, vomit blood, or see blood in the toilet. That gives you, right, a lot mm-hmm. of info. And then, yeah. oh my gosh, they're on a DOAC. What yeah. am I going to do? Right? Yeah, yeah. Totally. And then sometimes it's the things like I get asked for dental extractions. How long should I stop it? I get mm-hmm. asked for colonoscopies. How long should I stop it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, just remember most DOACs are very short lived. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they're they're dosed twice a day. So that's how you can tell yeah. they have a shorter half-life. Yeah. So usually two days before a procedure, if they're stopped, yes, their stroke risk is higher in that little window, but they need the procedure, right? Yeah. And you don't need to hemorrhage from a colonoscopy or yeah. a dental extraction. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But I still look it up. Like yeah. I question myself. Totally. You know? Totally. Okay. And then if it's a big surgical procedure, I'm like, well, geez, I don't know, you know, but are they going to heparinize them? So they're mm-hmm. controlled. Yeah. But, you know, they want you to make that decision. Mm-hmm. So don't hesitate to look it up. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is so much fun. And I, I just want to, I just want to talk to you for hours, <laughs> I but I do want to be respectful up. of your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is such an honor to have you on here and you're such an awesome lecturer. Are there other conferences you're speaking at, or is there any other place people can um, learn from you? Well, or? skin, bones, hearts, and private parts, uh, next year, three different times I'll be Wait, doing the cardiology day. What have is that? Heard of the I've not heard of that conference. Oh so my God. That's it's, hilarious. <laughs> it's for, um, Chuck Dillahy is the, the, the founder of this company uh-huh. and he asks, uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners to talk to primary mm-hmm. care audiences, and it's called skin, bones, hearts, and private parts, because for a week you go to say Pensacola beach or Virginia mm-hmm. beach, and you get a day of dermatology, orthopedics, oh. cardiology, uh, and private parts. G-Y-N-G-U. So four, four days, G Y N G U thing. So it's a great way for continuing education, I love that. but it's really geared toward it. So I'm covering topics mm-hmm. like um, lipid management, what yeah. not to miss in primary care, oh, like aneurysms so or acute MIs, um, how to do a good telehealth visit, a yeah. cardiac telehealth visit, right? Oh, yeah, perfect. Um, go through that. So I think that's, those are some things coming up in 24. Nice. Um, I've worked with this company in different regions, but I just think, you know, reach out to me, feel free to share. It's margaret.bowers at duke.edu. Oh my gosh. Wait, um, get ready for the influx. <laughs> I'm okay. I have students all over the country. And I think regional practices is the other thing we have to respect. And remember, we are all in this together to care Mm -hmm. for our patients and their Mm -hmm. loved ones, right? Yeah, definitely. That's why we do it. This was so much fun, Liz. I really can't thank you. I got to be real with someone and chat. Love um, it about I love what it. I love to do. Well, you are welcome back anytime. Any topic you want to get on a soapbox for of like primary care, you need to talk. <laughs> uh, that's what I say. I I was a critical care CNS, became an FNP, and I love blending both worlds. So good, so good. Well, thank you so much.